now to introduce our next speaker. Once again, this session is just amazing speakers, one after the other. This one is an individual that I have been hoping we can get here to Tel Aviv, all the way from Australia for a very long time. It's been very, very challenging for us to get him and I'm very happy that he can be with us today. So who is this next speaker? Well, he's a world-renowned expert on application security and internet security. He's a regional director with Microsoft and a Microsoft MVP. That means most valuable professional. More than that, he teaches courses online. He's one of the most favored authors and instructors on Pluralsight, which is a very popular uh, platform for courses and trainings. And he is the leading expert on data breaches because he is the founder of a very important website and a resource called haveibeenpawned.com. It's got nothing to do with pawn shops. It's actually a little bit of hacker slang. And this next speaker will tell you everything about it. So what can you learn from eight or nine billion records breached in the past couple of years? And what is the purpose of aggregating all of that information and providing a resource to the community? To learn more about that, please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Mr. Troy Hunt, all the way from Australia. Troy, please join me up here on stage. Thank you. Troy, here's your clicker. Your yeah. time to shine. G'day. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about data breaches. I want to talk a little bit about have I been pwned first. And out of curiosity, who's used have I been pwned before? Okay, good. That's going to save me doing the background bit. So, have I been pwned is a little project I started about five and a half years ago to catalogue data breaches so that when incidents like Dropbox, LinkedIn, Ashley Madison happen, I put the data here, you go there, put your email address in, it tells you all these places your data has appeared that you never even knew about it. And I thought, oh, this will be a little bit of fun. Some of my mates will use it. And it's gotten really, really big. A busy day, there'll be 10 million people go to this website, which astounds me, honestly. Now, one of the things that happens when it gets very busy is I get a lot of questions from the press as well. So the press wants to know, what are these data breaches? How did they happen? Who did it? And everyone gets this image of who broke into the system. Everyone thinks there's going to be a hacker somewhere and they're trying to picture what the hacker looks like. And I want to help everyone visualise what hackers look like. So I went to Google Images and checked. I hate you. I was going to say that they're all Mark Rogers, right? <laughs> and you, you see this trend, right? And, and the trend is always scary. It's always like, there's hoodies and there's green screen and there's binary. And I guess the binary is important because they're hacking, you know, I get that. But this is the imagery that's used. And the thing about the imagery is it creates a sense of fear. It's all dark, it's all scary. People think this is what hackers are and they worry about this. And then the newspapers sell more newspapers and you read more online pieces and there's more ads. And then the security companies use it to scare you into buying their security things. Now, the reality is often very different, and I'll give you a good example of this via the TalkTalk Talk incident. Massive, massive incident in the UK in 2015. TalkTalk Talk is a huge telco, and they had a breach which they said cost them £77 million. It's a massive data breach. And I remember when the news first broke, and there was a lot in the press, and they were trying to figure out who did it. They were trying to do some attribution. And a true quote from a detective is he said, we think it is Russian Islamic cyber jihadis. <laughs> and I was, huh, what? Where do you even begin with that? And in reality, it, it wasn't. Uh, maybe the cyber bit, that was it. it. It turned out it was this guy. And you can see him here leaving court, except you can't quite see all of him. They had to blur his face because it was a 17-year-old child. Legally a child, somehow did 77 million pounds. How do you do 77 million pounds as a kid? Now, um, in England, they take these things seriously. So they took his iPhone away, and, and he did later get into a bit more trouble as well. But this is more the reality behind most of the data that I see and have I been pwned. It is either a child, insofar as they are legally still a child, or it's a kid in the way most of us go, ah, oh, it's a nice kid, and maybe they're 19, 20, 21. Young adult. 
Not overly sophisticated, not overly experienced, but they got time on their hands. And those of you with kids know how devious they can be with time on their hands. And they figure out ways to break into these systems. Now, very often they end up with passwords. So obviously we have a, a massive issue here around passwords. And what happens is these passwords get amalgamated together into massive lists and then redistributed by resources like this. So this happened in January. And this kind of turned my life upside down because this is when, when Have I Been Pwned just went really, really nuts in scale as well. I had someone send me data which they said is called Collection One. And collection one was a credential stuffing list. And all the credential stuffing list is, is email address, delimiter, password. Over and over and over again. Many hundreds of millions of times. 773 million email addresses in this one list alone. Not just that, 21 million unique passwords. Now, in case you're trying to do the mathematics here, 773 million people, but only 21 million unique passwords, what does that tell you about passwords? A lot of people have got a dog with the same name. That's what it tells us. And it's not just individuals reusing passwords, people are using the same passwords as other individuals. So clearly this is problematic. Now it also made mainstream press in terms of things like fortune. And one of the interesting measures I find with Have I Been Pwned is, is it going to be talked about in a media outlet that my mum and dad would watch? Or read? And in this case, yeah. So this is how it gets traction. Now, people see this and they go, wow, this is amazing. Like, all of this must be on the dark web, right? Because we keep getting told the data is on the dark web. The dark web is where the scary people go, and that's where they have all of our data. Well, yes, it's there. Uh, you can also download it off Twitter. And, and this is the thing. Like, this data is so pervasive that it's all over public social networks. So you'll see from the image there, there's collection one, which is what I had. That was the 773 million records. Also, collection two, collection three, collection four, collection five, I had about 8% of the data. All on Twitter, all redistributed by Mega. None of the links work now, so don't go rushing off to try and find this, but it's a Google search away. Billions and billions of records. My email address is there. A password I used many years ago that I should not have used is there. Your data is probably there too. So what happens now? We've got these great big credential stuffing lists, email address, password, pairs. Well, people then go and mount attacks like this. Now, what you're going to see is a, a short little video clip of someone demonstrating what they do with the credential stuffing list. OK, you guys are not hearing audio. So when I said to the audio guy before, will the audio make sound? This was the bit I was talking about. I'm going to go back. I'm going to try it one more time. Otherwise, I'm going to improvise. All right, let's try this again. So, and there was this screen, and then there was audio. Okay, so here's what he says. <laughs> what he says is, what he's done is he's created a program to check Spotify accounts. Now, it's kind of funny in the longer video, because he's like, let's imagine you have a lot of Spotify accounts, that they're all your own, and you need to automatically check them, and then you put all of your own email addresses, these are yours, and passwords in a list, and you run them against the Spotify checker. So what people are doing is they're looking at what is the process to say authenticate to a Spotify API. So they just reverse engineer the rich client app. And they go, oh, it's a post request to this path, one field called email, one field called password. And then they take a list like this, and they multi-thread it, and they bounce it through proxies. And they just keep seeing how many of these passwords and emails work on Spotify. Doesn't matter where they came from. They almost certainly didn't come from Spotify. But the prevalence of password reuse means that a bunch of them are going to work on Spotify. Now, he then goes on to another screen here. Now, as you can clearly hear from the audio embedded in the slide, what he's saying is, now I'm going to run this against Spotify. And every time this goes green, this is a credential pair that works. In the audio, he says, you can steal these if you want. I've got about 9,000 of them. All his, too, incidentally. 9,000. And it only works because people are reusing their passwords. Now, these passwords have come from data breaches that many organizations don't even know about. And one of the biggest challenges that I have is getting an organization to respond when I tell them they've been hacked. Now, I'll give you an example of this. This is a website called Adult Fan Fiction. And you can kind of get a bit of a sense of what the site's about based on the banner ad. 
It's like, imagine there's two vampires that are really in love and they're gay and you want to write a story. Look, I don't judge, I don't care. You can write stories about whatever you want. What I care about is that I've got a truckload of your data that someone just sent me and I would like you to know about it. Because the data in here is not just so that you can read like vampire porn. Didn't see this talk going there, did you? It's also so that you can log into your bank account and your social media account and your email account. The email account's kind of important because that's the skeleton key to everything else. So I emailed them and said, someone has sent me your data. Here I am, I'm a legitimate person. Here's a video of me literally testifying in front of Congress. I'm not like some rando. Uh, by the way, here's some snippets of your data. Here's password hashes so that you know this is legit. They ignored me. Two and a half weeks go by and I published it on Have I Been Pwned after trying a whole bunch of channels to get in touch with them. 186,000 records, names, dates of birth, email addresses, passwords stored in both MD5 and plain text. Maybe it makes it easier to upgrade the hashing algorithm if you've still got plain text. Don't do this. So the data goes up and then people start posting on their forums saying, hey, have I been pwned sent me a notification? Because I send emails to about 2.8 million of my subscribers when any one of them appears in a new breach or load. So people are saying, hey, my data's up there. What's going on? And one of the administrators of the forum got in touch with me, demon goddess. And she wasn't real happy about this. She said she's been working hellacious hours at her day job. And I did have this moment where I was like, what does Demon Goddess, who runs like adult fan fiction, do for a day? It doesn't matter. You should have replied to my email because I contacted you and I tried to do this the nice way. She was actually unhappy about it. Verified the data doesn't exist. She was wrong. The data did exist. I expect you to remove this from your data breach website now, please. So I didn't, obviously, because it was legitimate. But this is what I'm dealing with day in and day out. And, and the real challenge for me is getting organisations to respond responsibly in the face of severe deficiencies in their security. Now, I want to leave you with a, an image that just perfectly illustrates this problem. I was on the internet the other day and, and I saw this. And it's a biometric padlock. And there's this guy with a YouTube channel, he's called The Lock Picking Lawyer, and he goes around doing physical penetration tests of padlocks. You know, things like big bolt cutters, how do I break into it? And anyway, he's, uh, he gets this padlock, and he has a look at it, and he, he finds that there's, there's actually a screw just here on the side of the padlock. And the screw does exactly what you think it does. Like, he takes out his screwdriver, he undoes the screw, and he's like, well, that was easy. <laughs> you know, the padlock opens. And that, in and of itself, is amusing. But the beautiful part of this was the way the organisation responded when he contacted them, because it just perfectly illustrates what I go through almost every single day at the data breach. He contacts them privately, responsibly, and says, look, I took my screwdriver out, I undid the screw, lock fell apart. And the organisation said, this padlock is invincible to people who do not have a screwdriver. <laughs> And this is exactly where we are at the moment. Thank you very much. Such a professional. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, may I take a second to tell the audience something? May I mention Project Svalbard? Yeah, sure. Okay, so some exciting, do. very exciting news for, for Troy this year. He's decided to actually take this amazing initiative of Vibe and Pwned and to make it into a large-scale global project. The code name is Project Svalbard and you're seeking investors, I believe, or uh, well, partners. I, I'm, I'm trying to find an organization that wants to take it on board. An organization that wants to take it on board. And who wouldn't? So ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> keep your eyes out for Project Svalbard and the future of I Been Pwned. Thank you so much again, Troy, for being a part That's of scary. our event. I hope Thank to you. see you again in Tel Aviv soon. See ya. All right. So how do we take it from here with all of the ideas and inspirations that we have from these three amazing speakers? Mark showed us that we should not be afraid of hackers, that we should embrace hackers, that we should raise hackers. I'm proud to be here today because of the inspiration that my parents, my father and my mother gave to me to pursue my 
passion of cybersecurity and hacking. In fact, I think my father might be in the room today. So, hi, Dad. Isn't that fun when you can do that? But more importantly than that, yes, I know, Mark, you agree with me. More importantly than that, we learned from Mark a very important lesson, and that is don't just expect people to look a specific way. Don't judge a person because of their, the color of their hair or their shape, their size, their gender, the jacket that they wear. Treat people with respect and learn from everybody, and especially those who can break things. They might be your best allies. From Jaya, we learned important truth about the realities. If there are any actual trenches to the world of cybersecurity, they are where the ISPs are operating. They are in the global routing, in BGP and DNS, and the global infrastructure of our internet. That's the actual trenches where battles are fought. And we learned from Jaya that you need to call people to action, to change their approaches, and to work together to stop some of the dangerous trends happening in those trenches. From Troy, we heard about the dangers of password recycling and from what happens when so many data breaches go up there into the world, how they spread fear and uncertainty and what we can do to prevent that. I hope you take these messages to heart. My name is Karen Alazari, and I hope to see you again soon at Tel Aviv University. Thank you, everybody. Sayonara.